Uh, welcome, please, Bruce Fulton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, I uh, share your sentiments about um, uh, the delight that I have that our year and a half of planning and correspondence uh, across the Pacific Ocean has finally borne fruit in uh, this program today. Um, I'd also like to second Michael's uh, acknowledgement of the uh, generous support of the Korean Cultural Center here in uh, New York City, the Hanguk Munhwa uh, one, uh, and its director, Yi Woo Sung, and, uh, and also Hwang Yun Ji. Thank you. Thank you very much. The uh, Korea Literature Translation Institute, the Hanguk Munhak Banyak One in Seoul, is a uh, is an organization that since uh, its inception in 2002 has supported the translation of Korean literature into a variety of languages, sponsors a variety of public events. Um, there is a literary forum here in New York City in the fall of 2009, and um, I'm, uh, Ju Chan and I are grateful for their ongoing support as well. Um, uh, we'd also like to thank uh, Nina McPherson uh, for um, uh, coordinating uh, the various components of this program. Um, and finally, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my good wife and, and uh, translation partner, Ju Chan Fulton, who um, often, uh, I often find myself um, in public by myself, but representing what in fact is a, is a, is a lifelong partnership. Um, the program today will um, will start um, uh, with my acknowledgement of uh, several publications of Korean literature and translation by Columbia University Press, um, and I will do a short reading from a volume that Ju Chan and I published as part of that series. And after that, uh, the remainder of the program will be devoted to. Uh, readings and a dialogue involving two of my favorite writers, Susan Choi and uh, Kim Young Ha. Um, I believe we'll have about uh, 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes for audience questions and answers after that part of the program. So uh, let me start by um, um, uh, saying thanks to Columbia University Press um, the process of getting literature and translation to the attention of the public involves not just uh, the selection of appropriate text and the process of bringing it alive in English. Uh, it also needs to be, this should sound obvious, but uh, often those of us involved in translation don't really pay much attention to it. Uh, it needs to find the right publisher. And by the right publisher, uh, I, I mean, a publisher that um, has the wherewithal to, uh, to put the book uh, in the market that it has in mind. In term, uh, with Columbia University Press, uh, over, over many decades, uh, the press has um, issued uh, a number of books that uh, have become indispensable texts for classroom use. Uh, like many university presses, they uh, tend to keep the books in print for a long time. What distinguishes Columbia from other university presses is, uh, is, is the visual presentation of the books. Um, and I hold before you uh, one such example. Um, Columbia not only has a very active publicity and marketing department, they have in the person of Chung Jae Lee, one of the best uh, cover designers in the business. And uh, this is the cover of uh, our book, Lost Souls. And um, I understand that, uh, that this cover won, uh, won an award. So, uh, but until, uh, until five or six years ago, uh, Columbia had published virtually no volumes of Korean literature in translation. And then through a, um, a project uh, sponsored by the Samsung uh, Cultural Foundation, uh, a series of anthologies were published first in Korea, in Korean, and then, uh, uh, and then here in English translation. And 
uh, at least three of those anthologies have been published by Columbia. Um, and then, within a couple of years, Columbia started publishing single volumes, um, uh, literature by, by, uh, by individual authors, starting in 2006 with a poetry collection by uh, the poet Kim so uh translated by David McCann, called Azaleas. And uh, uh, two years later, uh, Ju Chan and I were fortunate to have a collection of stories by Che Yun, uh, published by Columbia, called There a Petal Silently Falls. Um, this volume won a translation prize in Korea. And then the following year, three volumes were published. And uh, my original um, uh, intention when I contacted Michael last year was... Uh, uh, that um, these three volumes of modern Korean literary classics uh, should be a cause for celebration. Um, the, uh, the first of the three volumes was um, a collection of essays by uh, the writer Lee Tae-jun. Uh, these uh, essays in Korean Mu Sorok in Janet Poole's translation, Eastern Sentiments, were composed during the colonial period, that is the 35 or 36 year period, depending on your chronology, uh, during which Korea was a colony of Imperial Japan. Uh, colonial period writers uh, had an especially difficult challenge how to uh, maintain their integrity as artists in a, in a, in a, in a, in a colonial society. Korea was the only colony, um, was the only sovereign uh, state to be colonized by a non-Western uh, power. Um, so how, how were artists to maintain their integrity in such a situation? This was, uh, this was a lifelong question for many of our, uh, many of our colonial period writers. Lee Tae-jun is also one of the writers who ended up in North Korea after liberation uh, from Japanese colonial rule in 1945. There was a three-year period in which there was an intense amount of political, cultural, economic ferment in Korea uh, after the sudden uh, disappearance of, um, of Japanese military forces and the Japanese colonial administration. Um, there was uh, a great deal of freedom, but also uh, a certain amount of chaos and a, uh, and a lot of geographical movement between what are now present-day North and South Korea. Uh, approximately 100 established writers in the South uh, went north. Uh, sometimes the word defect is used. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that was the intention of many of these writers. Uh, writers also came from the north down to the south. Um, Lee Jun was one of the writers who went north, and uh, information about him since has been, has been scanty. We, we are reasonably sure that he's no longer among the living. Janet Poole, who translated uh, Eastern Sentiments, um, found that as late as 1986, apparently he was working in a cement factory up north. But Lee Tae-jun was, was one of our finest stylists. He wrote uh, a manual on literary composition um, that is still of interest to scholars. And uh, his essays formed the first of the three volumes that Columbia put out in 2009. The second volume was by uh, one of the outstanding writers of, uh, of modern times in Korea, a household name both in Korea and in Korean communities outside of Korea. I'm talking of Pak Won So. And the novel that was translated was an autobiographical novel that she wrote um, later in her life. And um, uh, Pak Won So's life, her, her creative life, is a, is a fascinating story. In, uh, in the spring of 1950, uh, when she was about to uh, enter university, she was accepted at, uh, at Seoul National University as one of the first, uh, the first uh, Korean literature majors, um, which the first class of Korean literature majors to include women. 
Um, but uh, a couple of months later, the Korean War broke out, and uh, Ms. Park never was able to, uh, to complete her education at Seoul National University. What she did instead was to, uh, was to raise a family of five children. And it wasn't until 1970 that she began publishing. But in the next 40 years, she, she published um, a number of novels, short story collections, um, memoirs, and this novel, Who Ate Up All the Shinga, uh, an autobiographical novel uh, that begins with her, uh, with her childhood in uh, Huanghe Province, which is in, in present North, um, in present day North Korea, um, her almost getting into Seoul National University, um, and uh, uh, an account of her life uh, with her family as a refugee during the Korean War, um, and so forth. Um, Ms. Park was uh, a beloved writer uh, because of her capacity to empathize with her with her readerships. She was able to to transform uh, the events of her own life <coughs> into into fiction <coughs> in a way that very few authors are. And uh, combining that subject matter wa with uh, with a colloquial uh, writing style uh, Readers have the almost uncanny effect of being in the physical presence of the author, of listening to the author telling you, and you only, her story, and telling you her story with the with the background, uh, giving you the 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 sense that uh, that she knows that you have undergone many of the same experiences, some of the same trauma that she did. And um, such was the extent of that connection between author and reader that uh, she early on developed the nickname of the Yepchip Ajima, the anti next door. So readers would, you know, imagine themselves in a presence with a, with a senior or respected person listening to her life story, knowing that she was also telling you about part of your life story. Ms. Pak uh, passed away in January, and probably um, uh, in, in death received more attention than any Korean since um, uh, the passing of Cardinal Kim many, many years earlier. And, and the third volume is the volume that Ju Chan and I translated, uh, Lost Souls by Hwang Sun Won. Uh, whom we have known and translated for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, Mr. Huang is, in my humble opinion, the most accomplished writer of short fiction in modern Korea. And this book comprises his first and third and sixth story collections. He published over 100 stories, as well as eight novels. Uh, it's the stories where I think he, he reached the pinnacle of his art. Um, he was a native uh, northerner. His family comes from around Pyongyang, and he came south with his family in uh, 1946, I believe. Uh, they all arrived safely, and uh, he became a teacher at Seoul High School and then a professor of creative writing at Kyunghee University in Seoul. Passed away in the year 2000 at the ripe old age of 85. Fortunately, uh, Ju Chan and I had the opportunity to spend um, many hours with him talking about his life and his literature, and uh, this book is, is one of the fruits of that. Um, I'd like to read a short passage to, to give you a, a taste of, of his writing, and uh, it's from the very first story in his very first story collection, which was published in 1940. Um, the, the stories in this collection uh, were all written when um, Mr. Huang was a student at Waseda University in Tokyo. Like a lot of um, uh, young Korean intellectuals of his day, uh, he received um, uh, mo most of his um, higher education in uh, Seoul. He studied English literature. One of his teachers was uh, the brother of Tanizaki uh, uh, Junichiro, uh, who, was, uh, who was an English literature professor. Um, the stories in this first collection, all of which were written in the late 1930s, 
uh, are variously stories um, uh, set uh, in the metropolises of, uh, of Pyongyang, Seoul, and in one case Tokyo, um, giving us glimpses of the lives of, uh, of young urban intellectuals. Um, also stories set in the countryside in which we um, see that Mr. Huang was strongly linked to Korean tradition. Uh, he was a born storyteller, and one of the reasons is that he listened to a lot of stories when he was growing up. Um, I often had occasion to ask him about the genesis of some of his stories, and often he would say, well, this is a story I heard uh, from one of the elders when I, when I was growing up. Um, Mr. Huang, among other things, uh, in addition to being a fine storyteller, has a very good ear for, for language. And <coughs> in some of his stories, um, he uses a form of indirect dialogue in which he reports conversations, not through with quotation marks, but, but indirectly, which um, uh, uh, creates a kind of curious tension when you're reading a third-person narrative, but it's if you're, you've entered into the mind or looking over the shoulder of the characters who are involved in the dialogue. And um, uh, I think you'll be able to hear this in the short piece I read from uh, this first story, which is also the title story of the first collection. It's called The Pond. <coughs> It all began, this tutoring job of Tessup's, when the wife of his college instructor friend introduced him to the girl's family. After the introductions were made and the friend's wife had departed, the first thing the girl's mother asked Tessup was how long he had known the wife and how he had gotten to know her so well. When Tessup responded that she was the wife of a friend, the girl's mother asked him what he thought of a woman with three children who wore her hair short and frizzy and went around in a jade green jacket. Tesep had always felt that the wife's short hair complimented her face, and he said as much, adding, though, that the jade green of the jacket did not go well with her unnaturally dark complexion. As he said this, he became aware of the filmy gaze of the girl's mother. He tried to make eye contact, but the girl's mother promptly lowered her eyes. Her face, with its impassive expression, looked a bit puffy. After her labored breath and her labored breathing gave him the impression that she had a weak heart. The next day marked the beginning of the tutoring, which took place under the watchful eye of the girl's mother. The girl proved to be quick at memorizing her language lessons. But when it came to mathematics, she was perversely stubborn. She seemed to consider herself innately incapable of solving the problems. Tessup asked the girl if she had always disliked mathematics, and she vigorously nodded. And yet when she solved practice questions, she did it without assistance and could explain her answers when asked to do so. And she understood perfectly the problem areas Tessup explained to her but only when she had made up her mind to. It occurred to Tessup that he should make the girl understand the concepts underlying the math he taught her. As he considered this, he turned toward the girl. She was moistening the end of her pencil with the crimson tip of her tongue. Tessup hastened to find the easiest problem in the girl's homework and asked her to answer it. The girl looked at the problem, but all she did was continue to moisten the tip of the pencil with her tongue. Tessup hinted at the underlying concept, but still the girl merely kept her tongue to the pencil. Tessup realized he was devoting more attention to the tongue and lips of this healthy girl sitting in front of him than to the math problems, and he snatched the pencil from her. But before writing anything, Tessup likewise put the pencil to the tip of his tongue. He was surprised at his own action. His first attempt to solve the problem was incorrect. The girl's mother, seated on the warmest part of the heated floor, scolded the girl for having a silly smile on her face. Tessup felt as if the girl's cold, playful smile was fixing itself on his forehead, and again he attempted, in vain, to solve the problem. And again, the girl's mother scolded her to stop smiling. But now the girl laughed, 
It was funny having to study when her mother was paying closer attention to the instructor than she was, she told her, and then she laughed more loudly. Again the next day, the girl arrived home, whistling, and again her mother summoned her. And again the girl's mother moved as far as she could from Tessa, but the girl did not enter. The mother went out. When she returned a short time later, her body language said she had given up. She asked Tessa to do his teaching in the room across the veranda. In that room sat the girl, quite graceful in traditional clothing, her legs gathered to the side. On the wall behind her was a photograph of a sprinter poised for the start. As Tessa viewed the sprinter, the taut balance of the torso leaning forward and the toes dug into the ground, the eyes focused in an intense gaze, Tessup drew in his mind an image of the girl's hefty bosom hitting the finish line tape, leaving the ends to flutter in the air, and instinctively his thin body shuddered. And when his gaze fell next on the girl's fleshy knees, he hurriedly collected himself, picked up the nearest textbook, and began leafing through it. The girl gathered her legs to the opposite side and abruptly spoke up. There must be something in the eyes of others that made her feel there must be an emptiness in this house. Tesep looked up from the textbook and asked what she meant, and the girl responded with a question of her own. Did he think it strange that there was no father in this house? Tesep replied that he was aware there was no father. His friend's wife had told him so. The girl immediately responded that her mother told everyone her father had died, but in fact he was still alive. When she was old enough to know better, the girl continued, she learned that her father had taken a mistress and gone elsewhere to live, at which point he and her mother divided their assets equally and made a break with each other. Her father lived not far away, but had lost all his assets and for some time had been laid up with rheumatism and her mother developed a case of heartburn that had led in turn to heart disease. Instead of responding to this with comforting words, Tessup opened the algebra book in front of the girl and told her she should study hard and try to make her mother happy since it seemed her mother's one wish was for the girl to be a good student. No sooner had he said this than the girl produced a cynical smile and said she was sick of hearing her mother say that. And then she opened the sliding door to the room as if she had noticed someone eavesdropping outside. Sure enough, the girl's mother was in the yard preparing ingredients for kimchi, and she turned toward them, startled. So that's the very beginning of Huang Sun Wan's writing career, um, a story of sexual tension between a young man and a young woman. And with that, we'll, um, we'll now switch to, um, to uh, Susan Choi and Kim Young Ha. Uh, I first met Mr. Kim at a uh, conference, a translation conference, as it happened at Columbia University, I think in 2004? Maybe. 2004, and um, I, uh, I had known of Mr. Kim by that time. Um, uh, I had known of his, of his first um, uh, work of fiction published in Korea, Nana Nadal Pagwayel Koliga Ita, which uh, was published uh, uh, three or four years ago by Harcourt, as I have the right to destroy myself. Uh, I was familiar with his story collections, which uh, my students at UBC had already begun to translate. And at the conference at Columbia, Mr. Kim did a reading of uh, one of his earlier stories called whatever happened to the guy stuck in the elevator. And uh, he read a section of the story in Korean, and he read it so fast. And, um, and afterwards, I, I, I said, way, no, no, palayo. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, well, um, my, my intention was to, was to, was to capture the, uh, the, the lifestyle of, of, of contemporary people in Seoul. And, um, and this uh, young man is running for the elevator, and from the elevator he's running to catch a bus, and uh, one thing leads, leads to another. And uh, 
uh, and I thought the reading perfectly conveyed the kind of frenetic lifestyle that uh, I'm now experiencing in Seoul myself while I'm while I'm there in sabbatical. So um, um, uh, we we continue to keep in contact, and uh, and um, Mr. Kim and his good wife Unsu uh, came to uh, Vancouver University, of British Columbia, where I teach, and spent eight months there in. Uh, uh, 2008 and 2009, and um, uh, before that, uh, Mr. Kim had been on a uh, reading tour of North America. I usually do this every fall with uh, two contemporary fiction writers with the support of the International Communications Foundation in Seoul. And so uh, we've, we've kept in touch uh, over the years, and... Um, uh, look forward to seeing more of his works, um, both in Korean and in, in, in translation. Susan Choi I met for the first time. Uh, well, actually, we, we didn't meet, but we were together at um, a, uh, a one-day celebration of Korean film and literature at Berkeley, I believe. Um, in, uh, was that 2000? Three two thousand one. It was. I think it was two thousand three. Commemorating uh, the the centennial of uh, of Korean immigration to uh, to the United States. Um, but in two thousand four, um, uh, shortly after I had read Susan's debut novel, The Foreign Student, um, I decided I'd like to interview her for um, an English language uh, Korean studies journal called Acta Koreana. Uh, and Susan was kind enough to come into town from, uh, from Brooklyn. Um, what I didn't realize was she was seven months pregnant at the time and uh, she labored across the plaza at Lincoln Center to, to meet me. Um, um, I was I was I was quite grateful for for, for the opportunity. Um, I've since um, I've I've used um, uh, Susan's debut novel in uh, the course I teach on the literature of the Korean diaspora, and um, uh, Susan's second novel, uh, American Woman, um, was uh, was was something I read with, with, with great pleasure, especially when I noticed the, the irony in the title. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the book know that uh, it uh, was inspired in part by the experience of Patricia Hearst um, uh, when she was captured by the, was it the Symbionese Liberation Army. Um, and the and the novel is about uh, is about her her time as a fugitive when um, she was guided to uh, a series of safe houses across the United States. Uh, the local book critic, the Seattle Times, um, where Ju Chan and I live, um, wrote about American Woman as if uh, as if the Patty Hearst character was the American Woman. But by the time we get to the end of the novel, we find that the American Woman is is Jenny Shimada, the uh, the Japanese American woman who is who is Patty Hearst's handler. Um, Susan is going to be reading from her latest novel, A Person of Interest. Um, I, I'm going to let her tell you about that. Uh, I think that's perhaps her finest accomplishment to date. Um, so we will hear first from Susan, uh, who will tell you a little bit about a person of interest and read a short passage from it. Uh, then uh, Mr. Kim will tell you a little bit about his second novel in English translation, Your Republic is Calling You, and read a short passage from that. And uh, after that, we'll have a dialogue between the two writers, and I will be back with you before that to, uh, to start off a few questions. But um, please join me now in welcoming Susan Choi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, it's such a pleasure to sit and listen to Bruce talk and talk about books that I forgot for a minute that I was supposed to read. <laughs> I'd rather listen. 
Um, a Person of Interest, which is my third and most recent novel, is the story of an aging mathematics professor named Professor Lee. Um, he is an immigrant to the United States, but has been in the US for decades upon decades and thinks of himself only as an American citizen. And it's not until the events of the novel that he realizes that um, others don't necessarily view him in, in that sort of straightforward way in which he views himself. Um, Professor Lee is disappointed in almost every aspect of his life. His marriage has not worked out. His only child, a grown daughter, isn't speaking to him anymore. His neighbors think he's strange and difficult and that he doesn't take good care of his lawn. Um, and his departmental colleagues uh, similarly um, keep their distance from him. And these disappointments are particularly exacerbated by the presence of a young colleague, very young and popular, um, named Professor Hendley. And Lee suffers terrible envy of Professor Hendley until the day, sitting in his office, that an enormous explosion shakes Professor Hendley's office next door. And Lee realizes that a bomb has gone off in that room. It turns out that a mail bomb, a letter bomb, has been opened by his colleague. And his colleague is severely injured. Um, and Lee's first completely uncensored reaction is to feel gladness. And then his second reaction is to feel enormous shame at his first reaction. Um, and then he's swept up in the events that follow this explosion. And I'm just going to read a brief passage. At the hospital for once, he wasn't bothered with medical forms. It was the only hospital their town had, the same hospital in which Esther, his daughter, had been born, and in which Lee had undergone sundry minor procedures in the course of the decades. Lee arrived in his own ambulance in Hendley's chaotic wake, but once there, he neither saw Hendley nor heard anything about him. After the shocking, ghastly coincidence of having so closely felt the blast that had scorched and torn Hendley's body, and after the intensity of self-examination the blast had occasioned, this separation from Hendley felt imposed and mistaken. Lee felt Hendley's non-existent presence like a phantom limb on the far side of the wall of his hospital room, and he wanted to go to Hendley, to speak to him, even speak for him. By the time the interminable battery of tests and observation periods and medical interrogations had ended and law enforcement personnel were at last set upon him, Lee was bursting with unexpressed sympathy for Hendley as if he and Hendley were one. It was terrible, Lee said, his voice unexpectedly breaking. The retelling of it had made his skin crawl. It must be a mistake. Who would do this to him? Who would do this? Only sick people, animals. Could it have been a mistake? One of the policemen asked keenly. Maybe there's somebody else at the school that you think might have been the real target for this? This was before the FBI had arrived and brusquely shunted the locals onto the sidelines. Who would want to kill us? Lee asked weakly. We're only professors. We don't do anything. Before the interrogation began, Lee had felt a raw force piling up in his gut. Rage at the attempted murder of Henley belated fear for himself, the pressure of which just increased as the questions wore on. Lee had thought that talking would help, but with the policeman he found himself under constant restraint, required to add qualifications to every assertion, so that by the time he was free to go home, he was quaking. Are you sure you're all right? said the doctor who'd come to discharge him. I wonder if we ought to keep you another few hours. I'm all right, Lee practically shouted. I want to go home. Released at last, he floated down the hospital's hallways and through its main doors in surreal anonymity. But once he arrived on the sidewalk, he felt the atmosphere shifting. It was past nine o'clock. He realized he had not eaten dinner. The sidewalk approaching the hospital entrance met the curb in a T, and that T was outlined on both sides by crushed tufts of snake grass and recent tulips already losing their petals so that they looked like gapped teeth. Lee stared at the plants. They glowed a chill, livid white, as if blasted by rays of the moon. Their shadows were too long and so crisp that their edges looked razored. He realized that the tea was congested with people and lights, the harsh, bluish-white lights of news cameras. He stopped walking and squinted uncertainly. 
Professor Lee, he heard someone cry then in a voice like his daughter's. Lee swiveled his head in confusion, but before he could find her, the crowd surged toward him, stroboscopic with shadow and light. Professor Lee, said a new, sharper voice, can we ask a few questions? You were there when the bomb went off, weren't you? Yes, Lee said, on instinct pulling off his glasses, as he did when he lectured. Yes, I was, he repeated. Later on, many people, colleagues, students, his neighbors, his student Emma Stiles, whose voice he'd first heard calling him from where she stood in the arms of her roommate, attempting to speak through her sobs to reporters, asked Lee with amazement if it was really his first time on TV because he seemed born to it. Lee had had no trouble staring into the camera, his eyes blazing with rage. He had delivered his side of the story without pathos or exaggeration. In this way, the questioning by the policeman had been a useful preparation for him. But then he had launched into riveting, righteous invective. Whoever did this, he said, is a monster, a person, I don't even think you can call him a person, with no feeling for life. His hand was clapped, fingers spread at his heart, an indignant starfish. Professor Henley is one of the great thinking men of today. If he loses his life, we all lose, not just those of us who are his friends and colleagues, but this country. Lee almost spat at the revolting waste of it. Here's a man who's the future, and some son of a bitch tries to bomb this man out of existence. Lee himself was surprised by his eloquence. The volcano within had erupted, and he'd hardly been conscious of the column of fire that poured out of his mouth. They had used it all except the part with this son of a bitch, and they had probably wished they could use that part, too. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And now, um, Kim Young Ha will introduce, maybe, and, and read from Your Republic is Calling You, translated by Ji Young Kim. Please join me in welcoming Kim Young Ha. Uh, thank you, to Professor Fulton. Yep. Uh, so I really enjoyed uh, the Susan's reading. So. I asked her to, to read that part because I love that part. So you know, the the, the Professor Lee is very so sort of interesting character. So uh, the, the the first chapter, so he you know experienced uh, you know explosion and uh, he found how much he hated his colleague the Handley and uh, and in the hospital he found and. Uh, his uh, inner, you know, machoness or the power or something like that. So I like that part. Um, it's a very interesting character. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, I'm going to read my uh, the second uh, translation, English translation. So originally, is uh, my first novel in my home country, the South Korea. So original title is Empire of Light, but in the United States, uh, it was published uh, as uh, Your Republic is calling you more direct and uh, it can be, uh, my editor thought it could be a hook, uh, but <laughs> I, I don't think it, it, it works well, but anyway. Uh, this story is about uh, the spy, the forgotten spy from the North, so North Korea. And uh, I, so when I so did some research about for this novel, I found that many uh, the North Korean spies were forgotten because of, uh, due to the lack of hard currency of North Korea, so they cannot uh, maintain the network of spies. Well, so uh, they had to survive by themselves. Uh, they had to make their living uh, in the so very capitalistic society like uh, South Korea. So I thought it was very, you know, the funny and interesting. And uh, so I uh, imagined uh, what if uh, a spy was summoned uh, by North Korea? So it, it can happen because uh, so one day, one day the, the information agency, the, you know, some agent found that, you know, file of an, the spies. Uh, uh, what happened to this guy? So, okay, uh, let him up. So 
they can decide the kind of things. Uh, but it uh, can be disaster for the forgotten spy who you know is making his living in the south. And uh, my protagonist is has been living in South Korea in Seoul the twenty years, twenty years in North Korea and the twenty years in the South Korea. So he was summoned uh, by called by North Korean or uh, nobody knows. But one day just. Uh, he was given just one day to return to North Korea. So this story is about that his one, his uh, it's a, a day of his life. So, so I, at first I didn't think this story is about uh, the. I just thought this story is about the spy or some you know Kafkaesque uh, the things, but. After I finished this novel, I found that this novel is about the illegal immigrant. So my protagonist uh, thought himself as an uh, illegal immigrant, not you know the, the forgotten spy, because he forgot everything from the north and the, you know, the, But so I'm going to read uh, the. Uh, he recognized uh, the part of he. Is it recognizing himself as a uh, transplant kind of? Gyeong likes going to Seoul Art Cinema, where the old Hollywood theater used to stand. The theater shows the works of filmmaking titans of times past, relying on government funding to finance its operations. He feels safe and cozy sitting inside a dark, empty theater. He sometimes relaxes so much that he falls asleep. Here, he doesn't feel like an outsider. People come to see old films and they don't care who else is watching. These moviegoers are capitalist snobs who put on a show of being hip and ironic to conceal their snobbery. Large cities breed anonymity precisely because of this attitude, this pretension of sophistication. Everyone can live together, each person's real self hidden away. Homosexuals, criminals, prostitutes, and illegal immigrants like ki -young. But he's not sure if his analysis of his fellow moviegoers is correct. He would probably never be able to understand these young soulites. They may be pretentious, they may not be. Maybe because they grew up watching all kinds of movies from all over the world and got tired of Hollywood's current predictable fare, they have gone back to the origin of all of the copies. Maybe they have ended up sincerely loving Lucino Visconti and Oji Asjiro. Kiyong didn't leave the cultural experiences the others take for granted. He spent his childhood ignorant about King Kong and Mazinger Z, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan, Donald Duck and Woody Woodpecker, Superman and Spider-Man. Instead, he had to study Steve McQueen's Papillon and The Great Escape, movies that played on TV during every holiday in the South, and experienced Gone with the Wind and Ben-Hur on cable. He didn't know about the time the soccer titan Chabamgen was a Bundesliga star. He couldn't say, like the others, that he remembered the huge pop phenomena Kim Chuja and Nahuna. At liaison office 130, he memorized and rememorized the cultural facts and took quizzes on a weekly basis. But he learned his cultural history only intellectually. He could answer the questions, but couldn't feel what the answers meant. And this made him think of himself as a human made of circuits and microchips. He knew more facts about Jo Young Pil and Esther and Sateji than anyone else, and could rattle off the history of a professional baseball or the student movement of the 1980s. But this knowledge didn't feel the emptiness. He remembered the shock waves created by Lee Moon Se's second album and the Korean baseball series of 86 and 87 when Son Dong Il's Hete beat the reigning champs Samsung, but that memory could never be a substitute for his emotional citizenship. The tedium exuded by these movie buffs 
intimated Kiyong everything that elicited the disinterested comment, this is so lame, was unknown or at least new to him. He devoted energy and time figuring out which parts were boring to others. It was the life of a transplant, having to give his all just to understand the mundane. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim. And now let's, um, uh, let's get involved in a dialogue. Uh, we'll, start, we'll start with the two authors, and then, um, uh, and then we, can, we can open it up for questions and comments from the floor. Uh, I thought I'd start um, um, with, uh, with Susan and her, her first novel, The Foreign Student. One of the, um, uh, one of the reviewers of that novel, or maybe this came out during our, uh, during our interview, but you mentioned that uh, The Foreign Student was in large part a life project that developed into a writing project. And, uh, and this quote in turn reminded me of, uh, of uh, something I'd read by the, uh, the French psychoanalyst and literary essayist Jacques Lacan. Um, and the, the thing that captured my attention was he said that uh, the act of writing is, is in large part uh, an attempt to recover a lost narrative of one's life. And this uh, seemed to me particularly relevant in the case of, of Mr. Kim, who had a very unusual uh, childhood experience, which uh, came to light in a couple of presentations he made at, uh, at UBC and the University of Southern California. So um, maybe we could start by, by asking Susan to talk about this, this life project that became a writing project, and then maybe Mr. Kim could uh, respond with um, his story of how he became a writer. Um, I think uh, I think mainly what Bruce is referring to, or, or what makes sense to me about um, the Lacan quote, is uh, the aspect of my first novel that that really grew out of conversations with my father. Um, my father was born in Korea. He came to this country in the mid-1950s after the Korean War. And by the time I was growing up in the 1970s, my father had, um, had really done his best to remake himself as an American, sort of like Professor Lee. Um, he never spoke of Korea. He never spoke Korean. I don't speak Korean. Um, my father was actually rather adamant about my not learning. Um, and I was too lazy to go against him and learn on my own initiative, unfortunately. Um, so my father's life in Korea before he came to the, to the United States remained very shrouded um, throughout my childhood, in large part uh, due to his sort of, um, due to his conscious, constant efforts. And um, at the same time, my father used to suffer from very serious nightmares. And when I was young, I would often be awakened in the night by the sound of him screaming. And my mother finally explained to me um, very simply, she said, well, you know, Daddy's dreaming about the war. So th obviously this planted a, a seed of curiosity in me, and for years I wondered what, um, what had happened to him. And it wasn't until I was an older young person in my 20s or so um, and could drink beer legally, actually, that, uh, that we had the sort of breakthrough that only happens when you have a beer with your dad. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And I started, I started sort of filling in a lot of the blanks of my father's life in this way um, over, over the course of a long period of time, a lot of conversations, a lot of beers. And, um, and I would take notes, at first very surreptitiously, after, you know, after our conversation was over. And, um, and then after a few years of this, I realized that he maybe wanted to tell this stuff to me as much as I wanted to hear it. And we arrived at the point where I would just sit in front of him with my laptop open, and I would just type while he talked. And the foreign student came out of those conversations. It's, it, it really is a novel um, in that once I started writing it, you know, the narrative had its own demands, and, and uh, there are a lot of characters in it who are inve complete inventions. But it really, if not to the letter, um, in spirit, it's my father's story. And um, 
And so, yeah, that was, that was the first product of this sort of project of, um, I guess, recovering my father's, you know, what, what I thought of as his prehistory, because, you know, pre-me. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. I, think, I think one of the, one of the triumphs of that, of that first book in terms of its structure was the fact that not until the very end of the book do we find out uh, the reason for the nightmares. And uh, I remember, as I, as I mentioned, I've, I've used this uh, novel with my students, and, uh, and I asked them to think, why is it that this, uh, and, and, and this last, or uh, next to last chapter actually, um, is, about the, uh, is about the protagonist's experiences during the war, and specifically about he, uh, how he's captured by the national police and is tortured. Uh, in an effort to, uh, to 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 learn the names of uh, of who is who on the southern island of Jeju has been harboring a number of fugitives. This is shortly before the war breaks out, and um, uh, I think that if this if if this scene had been uh, placed at the very beginning of the novel, it it. Um, um, it, the novel would not have the, the kind of appeal it does to, to find out exactly uh, why this young Korean man ended up uh, at a college in the middle of nowhere in, on a mountaintop in, in Tennessee, uh, reluctant to communicate and, uh, and obviously um, troubled by, by something earlier in his existence. So now let's, let's hear uh, Mr. Kim talk about why he became a writer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so actually, I didn't uh, think about uh, how became, you know, I uh, became a writer. So, uh, but after the, the five years later and the six years later, so I was asked by, you know, audience and uh, so, so I had to find the answers. So, <laughs> and uh, but uh, I found the very you know so very so the big things in my past is uh, when I was young. So I when I was uh, ten years old and uh, I got poisoned by uh, so coal gas, so heating gas. It was very common uh, accident in that time, the Korea. So I got poisoned with my mother, and uh, so I woke up in the hospital. And uh, but at that time, I didn't uh, know. Uh, I lost my whole memory before ten. So, but you know that the children. The kids uh, do not uh, recollect their past. Uh, <laughs> they just uh, think about their homework and their, you know, new uh, friends and the new teacher and uh, uh, what am I going to do then the tomorrow. So I didn't know uh, so what I lost, what I had lost. But uh, after I tried to. When I tried to write something about my childhood, so I found I had no memory before 10. So uh, it was very interesting. So because uh, I always uh, thought uh, it was very crucial, it is very crucial. So one's childhood, so especially the author's childhood, was very is very crucial to you know, the use, uh, sort of make up his, uh, you know, the, the writing, the project was perfect. So, but, yeah, but, but I failed to recover my memories. So I got to think, uh, it occurred to me that uh, maybe I was, I'm writing the novels and short stories to you know, feel the whole of my uh, the past. Uh, it was empty, so I was always you know feel the floating, the floating, and not anchored to the earth. So, and I had a very you know big. Um, I had a very big uh, desire to make a story, and I really liked the tell the story 
to my friends uh, when, I, when I was to the middle school student and the high school student and my friends uh, liked to hear my stories so uh, why I you know so kept making stories and kept you know making you know kept telling the story to my friends so that's why I guess just a guess uh, so maybe like the Lakang's word so I might I might be, you know, so you know, doing something. So doing something for, you know, recovering my whole and, you know. Yeah. So we have carbon monoxide to thank yeah. for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one, right. Yeah. One of our finest, <laughs> one of our finest contemporary fiction writers. Uh, uh, another one of my. Um, uh, current academic interest, which is also consistent with my interest in Korean literature and its translation, is in the, uh, the power structure, the culture of literary fiction in South Korea. And uh, I remember when I was doing uh, graduate work at Seoul National University in the mid-1990s, and uh, I, uh, for one semester I stayed in the apartment of one of our authors who herself was on sabbatical in France, and I remember coming across a copy of a literary journal. There's, at any one time, there's about a dozen literary journals being published in South Korea. Uh, and, and the feature of this one that really caught my attention was that, uh, was the photographs of the authors. They were smiling. What's, what's the big deal about that? Well, uh, my previous exposure to literary fiction in Korea had, um, the cumulative effect had been, this is very serious business. And whenever I saw photographs of authors, either on, on dust jackets of books or, or in uh, newspapers, Usually the, the image was of an author in his 40s or 50s. It was almost always a male, uh, dressed in a suit. Hair at that time came down about to the ears. And the expressions were like this. <laughs> <laughs> My, isn't this a serious undertaking we're involved in, I used to think. And so you can imagine my surprise when I saw this, um, this literary journal. The, the photos were still black and white. But uh, more often than not, there were photos of women. They were young. They were smiling. And the, uh, the title of the journal itself, Munhak Tongne, literally uh, literary village, literary community, was a kind of a welcoming, reader-friendly approach. This, uh, this really took me by surprise. And it got, it got me thinking about, uh, about this, uh, this literary power structure in Korea that we, we call the Mundan. So I, w I was wondering um, what Mr. Kim's relationship is. He has, a, I think, an unusual relationship in that uh, for the past several years he's been living outside of Korea and writing. And uh, um, I'd like to hear his views, and then maybe Susan could, uh, could respond with... Uh, her relationship with um, the literary establishment in the United States, and maybe she'll have a few questions for Mr. Kim. So, um, can we start with, yeah. with, with Mr. Kim? Yeah, well, so good question. So, uh, the, so, becoming a writer in Korea is very, you know, different with uh, other the Western countries, like a, so. United States and uh, France and Germany. So, because, uh, yeah, you know, the, the, in the United States, the editors uh, have power. So they, you know, can the, pick their authors you know, from the, so among the aspiring writers and the aspiring, you know, the authors. But, uh, and the agent, the literary, literary agents, uh, in the United States, I heard that is they have, you know, the chosen uh, so who they represent. And uh, but in Korea, there is no culture of literary agents, no agent, uh, and and uh, editor has not much power so to pick their authors. Uh, so mostly, uh, so 
Korean you know, the literary critics have power to pick the authors as a the every so every the first day of the year, so there are so many so competition in the newspaper, the major newspaper. So we call this uh, Shinchunmunye or some uh, some other the competition. It has a very long tradition, so even uh, since uh, the colonial period. So uh, if I become a winner, so I am the authorized, you know, as a writer. So the competition is a is a with a. You need um, to ask uh, aspiring writers a short story, a non novel. So, with our short story or just the two stories, you can be uh, authorized uh, writers. Yeah. And uh, you are allowed, so allowed, you know, to enter the literary circles. So, it was very, you know, uh, it was very, uh, it's very important yeah, to uh, start. Uh, so one's car the career as a writer. So, yeah, but but there uh, was some change. So after 1995, uh, so the the Bruce Fulton, uh, so so the, the new publishing, the culture, you know, so and the new publishing house with the young people. So there was some change. So now uh, some magazines and some editors uh, can, you know, yeah, pick their authors and uh, you know, so without competition, without the critics, uh, you know, so approval. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and my case, so my case was uh, a little bit special because uh, uh, I didn't pass the the, the competition. <laughs> so I so I sent my short story to the major newspaper, uh, but they didn't like my numbers. So too much sexual tension and uh, <laughs> too dark for the new day. You know, so. Uh, the first day of the year, so you know, the in the at the first day of the news in the year, the newspaper, you know, uh, put the photo of the uh, new sun, you know, so big red sun and the uh, very so you know positive images. But um, the the story, the the short story I the sent to them is was very dark. As so two couple, uh, as a, a couple, so a man and uh, so a woman. Uh, enter into the the car trunk, and uh, they uh, had uh, the sex desperately because uh, the trunk was locked. So <laughs> they died uh, in the trunk. <laughs> so it was too dark oh, for yes, yeah. So I was very you know uh, so disappointed. So uh, I didn't expect that uh, response. So I sent my short story to very you know. Uh, the small the magazine and they are very you know the punky magazine so they liked my story so <laughs> okay we liked this we, we, we were looking for this kind of story so let's uh, publish it so I did it uh, but even then so I expected you know so many publishers and many editors uh, so uh, making call but uh, the kind of things that didn't happen. So <laughs> I had some hard times, uh, uh, but um, after I, you know, wrote some other the short stories and uh, so, yeah, and I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> couldn't make it. So, uh, so I was very, you know, rare case. But after me, so some other writers, uh, so. Went this way to so without competition, without you know approval of critics, uh, they made their way. So yeah, there was a surely a change in mm -hmm. Korean literary culture. Yeah. Susan, what what were some of the hurdles that you um, were were faced with when you were uh, first getting your stories and then uh, the foreign student published? 
you, you worked uh, for the New Yorker for, for a time? Uh, well, I feel like, it, I mean, the, it's, you can hardly compare the two situations. I mean, I think everyone in the room knows that the American publishing, I mean, system, there's no system. Mm -hmm. So um, there's really no comparison with, mm -hmm. uh, with this sort of system of authorization that we're talking about. I mean, um, it's a little, I don't know, it almost sounds kind of nice to me, the idea that, that the national newspapers would consider literary fiction yeah. of sufficient importance that they would want to control who gets to produce <laughs> it. I mean, in, yeah. in our country, you know, literary fiction is um, barely published anywhere mm -hmm. um, in the press any longer. I mean, The Atlantic doesn't even publish fiction anymore. Um, you know, The New Yorker just publishes the one story instead of two, and they're short, and uh, literary journals are struggling. So. Um, I don't know. I think that I think the bright side of this this nefarious yeah. uh, top-down <laughs> control is that <laughs> at least the top cares about yeah. literary production. Um, yeah. Because I don't they I don't do. think that there's that I don't think that there's that um, aspect in our culture. I feel like you know the publication of literary fiction is really struggling along, despite uh, you know the total indifference of um, a large proportion of the culture. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in in the time that I've been publishing, which um, would be about my first novel came out in 1998. Um, in the time between that one and my third, um, Person of Interest, which came out in 2008, the number of pages in, in newspapers across the country devoted to book reviewing, um, just by my own sort of anecdotal experience, it seems to have dropped by like 70, 80%. I mean, I remember the the um, the book reviews that, that we got for a Person of Interest, you know, uh, all over the country. And a lot of the newspapers don't even exist anymore. And those newspapers that do exist don't review books because reviewing fiction is not, um, it's not worth the column inches. So even, you know, the, the, the idea that there would be an establishment devoted to, you know, policing literature, like at least there's, <laughs> at least there's enough interest yeah. to police it. Um, yeah. So the, in Korea, so the so young writers uh, who, uh, yeah, there is dark side. The young writers who uh, are authorized by uh, literary critics and newspapers got many big pressure. You know, uh, they should do something, but they had no, you know, inventory. So, right. <laughs> no inventory. And uh, so, but I, I think uh, so. The United States system has a, so, a positive side. So. So young writers uh, can accumulate their energy. So accumulate. So before they publish their first novel or first short story collection. So, so and I want to ask uh, Sujan some. So, uh, a thing. Uh, so, how do you? How did you research about your the first novel? So you didn't speak uh, the Korean well and. Uh, have you ever been to Korea so before you wrote a novel? Uh, this was my question for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I had only been to Korea once when uh -huh. I was a child, and it, it, the, the trip didn't assist that much in the mm. writing of the book because the book is set in the book is set during the Korean War. And um, it was difficult actually. You know, my question for you was going to be yeah. how much research did you do <laughs> into, you know, uh, the ways of the ways of North Korean spies and how much pressure did you feel? Um, because I feel like with your book, one of the things I like so much about it is that, um, you know, that phrase that you read, um, the emotional citizenship, that I feel like what really matters for Ki Young is not necessarily that we know all about how he trained as a spy, but that the we understand what his emotional citizenship is, you know, and you don't have to do research to imagine your way into into the situation of um, someone who's so displaced and who, you know, like you, um, but slightly different. I mean, mm -hmm. Ki Young's entire childhood and upbringing are irrelevant to his adult life, and he he can't even reveal them. So, you know, like he's sitting in a movie theater trying to figure out how to be a person who knows when to say, "Oh, that's so lame," mm -hmm. <laughs> because he'll he'll never have the instinctive yeah. ability to do that in this culture, and. Um, so with foreign with the foreign student, I felt this deep pressure to get all the facts right, but mm -hmm. you know realized at some point that getting at an emotional truth about the character was going to carry the book more than um, avoiding making any mistake having to do with you know mm -hmm. when a certain battle took place or 
You yeah. know, what kind of art? I mean, I remember freaking out over what kind of beer they would drink, and a friend of mine saying, <laughs> what if they just drink beer? <laughs> <laughs> because I was trying to figure out what brand of beer they would be drinking in yeah. Korea in the, in the mid-50s, and he was like, how about if it's just uh. beer that they drink? Beer, beer. Oh, yeah. um, and so I, I think that that was part of it, was realizing that mm. trying to... Um, Trying to, shooting for psychological accuracy was, mm. was what was going to matter most. Uh, but, okay. I, but I did read a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one thing I was going to you know, ask you before is, uh, what was your father's uh, favorite beer? <laughs> <laughs> the Bud Light? So as a mystery, the, the, the Professor Lee? So. My father is a Bud Light drinker, actually. Really? I don't know uh, how you guess that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Black Label before that. Uh, right, I don't so. know if they make it My anymore. favorite beer is Heineken, so as a uh, Kyung's <laughs> <laughs> so favorite. So. Similar, these really light beers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but I, I did some research for my uh, novel, like you, so, but actually I didn't need uh, much research so for the novel because Ki Young has the uh, same as age as mine. So he mm -hmm. was born in uh, 1968, and uh, uh, he, you know, the entered into my s the same university as mine, the Yonsei University. So, so as a as a college student, I felt myself sometimes as a spy. So you know, in uh, 1980s. So very big student movement so occurred in Korea. So, uh, so in the university, there was a totally different culture. So out, out of the university, so we you know the listen to the very popular music, and uh, we couldn't read uh, Karl Marx and Engels and some the Marxist the philosophers the works, but. In the university, so it's totally different. They read uh, the Marx, Engels, uh, Marx, and the Lenin, and the Ho Chi Minh, and even the Kim Il Sung and the North Korean, uh, you know, leaders, uh, Chu Che ideas. And so I was very shocked. So I felt myself, you know, outsider. So very, you know, surprised. Like uh, the spy, the Ki Young, my protagonist, he was very shocked, but. But there was an irony because uh, he was from the North Korea, so the the origin of the Juche ideas and North Korean philosophy. But uh, he was, uh, you know, shocked. Uh, so South Korean, the capitalist society, the South Korean student studied the Juche idea. So he was very he felt. But yeah, but a story is there is a story. So I try to find the North Korean defector so for the research but I I I couldn't so to meet the someone because I didn't know how so could how I could find the North Korean defector hey you are North Korean defector no <laughs> <laughs> sorry so, but I heard there's uh, 20,000 and 30,000 North Korean defector in Korea but they uh, they leave uh, the somewhere, so I didn't know. So I just tried to Google. So, 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 Google. so I didn't expect much, but just a North Korean defector, the Talbukja. I didn't expect too much, but, but uh, so I found the three uh, websites and uh, I, you know, posted, uh, wanted uh, the someone uh, the born in the, 19, the late 1960s and the were 1970s and uh, intellectual and uh, the university graduate, blah, blah, blah. But all of a sudden, so the, just 30 minutes later, I got a phone call from a North Korean defector. <laughs> he was born in 1968 at the same age, age as mine and he was, he graduated the film school of Pyongyang. Yeah, so, yeah, the Pyongyang Film School is very hard to enter because uh, Kim Jong Il, the great leader, is a huge fan of films. So <laughs> only 30 or 40 students can enter the, the film schools. So he was, he is really elite. Mm -hmm. So people. So we met at sushi bar at so, uh, the very night. So I, so when I got the phone call. So yeah, it was amazing. So he gave me a so really, really detailed uh, the 
daily life of Pyongyang, mm -hmm. and uh, so he had uh, many relationship uh, with the uh, Pyongyang regime. So, so he gave me the hint of my novels, a North Korean spy, the forgotten spy. So, so one of them, uh, he told me, so one of them uh, lived even in Seattle. You know, so, <laughs> whoa, yeah, yeah. So it was a fascinating story. So uh, I can't believe, uh, but it was an interesting story, and uh, so that's, that's, that's my research. I, um, I'd like to leave. Well, do, I think we have we have to, we, we can field a couple, one or two questions, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yes. South Korea has wait for the South Korea has the reputation of being the world's most wired country. And a few years ago, a national digital library was open. And I was wondering what impact that would have if, if they're going toward electronic books now, what impact that would have on writing and translation and publishing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, so Korea is a very digitalized country, so, as you know. So. But uh, but we don't have uh, the Kindle, you know, <laughs> the like this uh, the digital device for ebook, and because uh, um, the sixty or sixty five percent of publication in South Korea is imported, you know the the foreign literature and the foreign you know, translated. I mean so from the United States, from the, the France, France, and the Germany. So Korean publishers uh, have some trouble to deal with the copyright issue with uh, the, the foreign authors. Like, um, for example, so Malcolm Gladwell uh, did not give uh, his, you know, so approval of digital publication in Korea. So I guess and many publishers in Korea, Korean publishers guess uh, someday in the near future, the, the American authors will deal, will publish their, the Korean translation in the United States, in Amazon.com. So kind of in uh, the iBook, instead of, uh, so, publishing it in the South Korea. So they hire their translator and they hire their, you know, so digital the agent. So they will, maybe, they will publish their own translations, Spanish version, Korean version, and uh, German version in the United States. Yeah, so many Korean uh, so publishers concerned about that, yeah. So, uh, Maybe uh, a question for Susan? Yes. Hi, I was wondering if your work has been translated into Korean and also if um, all three of you could maybe talk about whether diaspora work mm. is translating to Korean, what the market and the reception of that work is? Um, that's a great question. I would love the answer to that question, too. My first two novels have been translated into Korean, and um, I'd love to understand what the reception of them was, because I, I actually don't know. I found it hard to gauge um, how they had been received. I even found it hard to gauge as a, as a complete outsider to the publishing industry in Korea. Um, the status of the publisher, um, it's, it's, it's very, I think it's very opaque to an outsider, and even though I went to Korea and, and promoted these books in Korea, it was still very hard for me to understand. You know, I mean, in this country, I can sort of tell where a book stands, you know, it's hard enough, but in Korea, I had no idea, I don't even know, um, really, I don't even know how, I don't even know how the translations were, to be honest, I don't know what their quality was. Yes, um, I really uh, like um, the, the Sujan's style and uh, the keen observation, about the, the, and the detail, uh, you know, the description and uh, the, the interesting characters. But it is a mystery uh, why uh, the, the Korean-American writers 
do not, you know, so is are not accepted uh, by Korean audience. So, so Susan Choi uh, uh, is categorized in the Korean American writer in Korea. So, but Korean audience do not, uh, you know, do not uh, read eagerly the Korean American writers like uh, Chang Ne Lee. I really like uh, the Chang Ne Lee. So he's a, a fabulous writer, but. Uh, Chang Ne Li uh, was not successful in Korea, his home country. It was a very you know, it's a mysterious thing. So he republished uh, again and again his books, uh, Native Speaker. Like uh, so, he changed uh, the three times. So the publishers, mm -hmm. he, he changed the publishers three times, maybe one more. But uh, and he changed the translation. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. he did. Uh, and uh, his translator is, is great, and yours, yours uh, as well. But uh, Korean audience, uh, I think, I guess, uh, want to experience American things. Like uh, the Paul Auster is popular in Korea. So <laughs> but, uh, many uh, Korean, uh, you know, it's a good audience, good readers uh, love the Paul Austers. And they thought, uh, maybe they think, uh, so with Paul Auster, they can you know, experience the, the Brooklyn life, <laughs> the, the life in New York, or some, some postmodern things. Uh, yeah, so you and uh, the, the, the Chang Ne Lee and others are very realistic, and the keen mm -hmm. observation of daily life for the people, and uh, deep psychological you know, so things in the mind. But uh, Korean audience uh, do not I guess, just it's my guess, do not, you know, the look at the reality of the, the, the Korean American life. Yeah. Uh, so. I think another part of uh, another part of the issue is, as, as Mr. Kim mentioned a short time ago, about 35 percent of um, uh, of books purchased and read in Korea are translations. Are they not? Translated literature, about 35 percent? No, 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 60. 60? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, this uh, tells you right away that uh, the translated literature in Korea is something of an industry, and uh, uh, you can see why uh, authors might tend to get lost in the, in the shuffle among uh, all the other works uh, from a number of countries that are being translated. Yes. I wish we uh, had all afternoon to continue this very interesting conversation, and I do invite you all to have to continue over coffee in the loose room, which is just on the other side there. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Bruce Fulton, Kim Young Ha, and Susan Choi for being with us for a very interesting discussion today. Let's thank. You.